See, I used to be one of these people that thought that I was in control of my life. And no matter how difficult any situation was that God put in front of me, I could will my way through it. And that afternoon in the darkness of that ultrasound room, I found out very quickly that God controls everything, that I don't control anything at all. See, my wife was somewhere between 16 and 20 weeks of our second pregnancy, and this would normally be a happy time for a couple when they would go to the uh, OBGYN's office for the ultrasound. And when they take the ultrasound at this point in the pregnancy, you can see inside the mother's womb and inside the child, all of its internal organs. You can even hear its heart beating. And if you want, you can find out whether or not it's a boy or a girl. You know, we had a perfectly healthy three-year-old child at home. We had had no complications in our first pregnancy. So we had no reason to believe that this pregnancy would be any different than the first one. I'm not exactly sure what's wrong with your son, but I'm going to send you to see a maternal fetal specialist tomorrow who will be able to tell you exactly what's happening. And on the following day, October the 1st, 2008, a maternal fetal specialist informed my wife and I that my son had a birth defect called spina bifida. And I often tell people I have a child with spina bifida, and I ask them if they know what that is. And for a few moments, they act like they do. And then when they realize that they're really not sure exactly what it is, they ask me if I wouldn't mind explaining it. By no means am I a medical doctor, but when your child has a birth defect, it's going to impact their quality of life for the rest of their life and more than likely the rest of yours. As a parent, you want to know as much as you can about it. I did not yield. I gave my all for your battlefield. My wife sat across from me in our home, paralyzed by fear, with tears running down her face. And she looked up at me as she was reading these things and she said, I'm going to hell. I said, Ashley, what are you talking about? She said, I'm actually thinking about aborting this baby. Now let me take a step back here and defend my wife and I. You know, I mean, you're not going to find two more pro-life people in the country than Ashley and I. I mean, we live every principle of the pro-life movement, every minute of every hour of every week, of every year, caring for our son. And you know, when you're in these types of situations, you have weak moments. When I was weak, my wife was strong. And when she was weak, I was strong. I'm here to tell you that fear of the unknown will test your faith beyond the realm of description. And fear is a funny thing. It could have made my wife and I angry. And that anger could have turned to bitterness and resentment for the unfair situation we found ourselves in. But as I've read the gospel and the Bible so many times and sought out the catechism and teachings of the Catholic Church to understand what it means, I've never heard Jesus use that word fair. Life's not fair. So instead, my wife and I chose to let it drive us to a point of selflessness that I don't think either one of us knew was within us. And I can assure you it wasn't possible without divine intervention. And we decided to embrace the emotional, psychological, and spiritual suffering that would accompany this journey, along with the daily trials and tribulations of caring for a child with this type of need, out of unconditional love for each other, for our oldest son Ephraim, and for our unborn child. Just like Christ bore all those things under the weight of the cross for us on his march to Calvary. To be nailed to it for our sins out of unconditional love for you and me. And you know, don't let the secular media or the world fool you. Real love has nothing to do with the way you feel. Real love is a decision. I wrote this book for two reasons. I wrote it for my oldest son, because one day the pages of that book are going to help him understand in a way no words his mother or I ever used, ever will. 
And secondly, I wrote it since because 1973, there have been 50 million children aborted in this country and 1.2 billion around the world. I'm a history teacher, so take my word for it. You can take all the casualties from every war in human history, and you can add them up all together. And that doesn't scratch the surface of 1.2 billion. And you know, there are no sound arguments against the moral principles of the pro-life movement. And it has had courageous people who have been a voice for the unborn. But what it has lacked is a story, a story that bridges the gap between those principles and reality. This is that story, a story that gives the pro-life movement one of its own, an unborn child in the womb crying out for help that was heard by a community of believers who in the 2008-2009 school year, when those teenagers prayed that hard for an unborn child in the womb, whether they realized it or not, they acknowledged he was alive. And before Eli took his first breath on this earth, when you read that book, you will see God was using his life from the womb. I gave my all for your battlefield.